Today is a very interesting day because Lokniti, the blog, is going to have one of its most interesting interviews. We are going to interview Professor Robert Walker from the Oxford University whose research interest is aligned with the kind of interest that this blog uh, tries to address and that is poverty, social inequality and social exclusion. So uh, very soon we are going to talk to him and find out more about his understanding of social exclusion, how it operates in the global north, how it operates in the global south and also how it uh, features in terms of the uh, fiscal allocation for social uh, welfare projects. Let's uh, look forward to it. Okay. We have with us Robert Walker. He's a professor of social policy in the Department of Social Policy and Intervention at the University of Oxford. He's a research affiliate of the National Poverty Center, University of Michigan, and a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts. His research interests include poverty, social exclusion, family dynamics, and budgeting strategies. He has published close to 20 books, over 50 research reports, and more than 150 academic articles and chapters on poverty, social security, and research methodology. So Professor Walker, I'll start off with the first question. Uh, you recently published your book, The Shame of Poverty, in collaboration with Professor Sony, right. which analyzes the social and psychological dimensions of poverty in diverse societies in Europe, Asia, Africa. What do you think is the policy implication of such a phenomenon? Policy implications are fund fundamental at, at many levels, but it's, it's worth thinking about the research itself first, which really came from a student reading another in Indian, Amartya Sen's work. Okay. And she found in there the notion that, where, uh, that shame lies at the irreducible core of poverty. And I don't quite know what that means. But one way of thinking about it is that it means that wherever you find poverty, you find shame. And we thought that was a really interesting idea. Um, and so in a sense, the research grows out of a master's student doing a, doing a paper for a, for a class. But then we thought, well, is it true? And it sort of rang bells with my own experience, talking, working alongside with people in poverty in the global north. 30 odd years or so, uh, recognising that when you talk to them about their lives, yes, it's difficult making ends meet, there's financial stress, but it's basically how I feel and how society makes me feel, which comes out of the conversations first and is highlighted. So if it's true that shame is associated with poverty, we set out to look at very different places on the argument that if there was a story in different places, perhaps the idea that poverty and shame always went together might be true, at least if we found one place where it wasn't, we could say to a marcher Sen, you're wrong, it's not always, it's not always present. And so that's how the research came into, into being. But as we, as we got involved in the research, we began to realise that shame is not just an emotion that hurts, it's not just an emotion that is felt, it's emotion that's imposed from outside in, in terms of people's dealings with other people, and particularly in their terms of their dealings with the system, uh, the bureaucratic system, the system that provides support, education, health, social protection. And so one then began to think about the delivery of policy. Now, social psychologists argue that shame is not just this inner hurt, but it's also the consequences of that inner hurt which lead people to withdraw from society, uh, leads them in, in some cases into situations where they try to hide their circumstances. And so they find themselves saying to people, everything's okay, it's normal, there's no problem. Where they know underneath that there's a deep problem and that mismatch, you know, always living at risk of being exposed so that you avoid situations where you can be exposed, reduces your social capital, undermines your sense of self, your confidence in yourself, your sense of agency, all of which you might argue undermine, therefore, a person's ability to cope with their circumstances and perhaps adds to the perpetuation of poverty. Now, if policy is carrying shame with it, if policies are stigmatising, 
you could see a situation where the policy goal, an anti-poverty program, is to help people uh, move out of poverty, whereas at the same time, you're imposing shame, which we are suggesting reduces their ability to get out of poverty. And so the policy implications are quite profound. They suggest that maybe the policies that we're putting in place don't work for the reason that they don't address the social, social psychological dimensions of poverty. Sorry, long-winded answer. So, but since you mentioned poverty eradication, we have the world which adopted the agenda for sustainable development by the year 2030. And if the primary goal was eliminating poverty in all its extreme forms, how should developing countries like India approach this goal, given the mixed success when it came to realizing the Millennium Development Goals? I think as for those countries to decide for themselves, that's what governance is about. It's certainly not for an academic to impose and it's certainly not for the Global North to impose. One of the great things about the Sustainable Development Goals, unlike the Millennium Development Goals, is that they apply to my government as well as your government. And I think that's important because it begins to, to think, enable us to, forces us to have a conversation which is within the South, within the North, across North and South, so that we can begin to learn lessons and we can begin to work together. And if you like, going back to shame just while we're talking about it, if it's true that uh, shame is consistently felt north and south as a result of being poor, even though our measures of poverty are profoundly different, so historically we haven't been able to talk about poverty in extreme forms in the global north because it largely doesn't exist. But on the other hand, if the, if the consequences are the, are the same, uh, then we've got a basis of a global conversation and indeed arguably a form of global measurement. So you say uh, eradicate poverty in all its forms, that raises the question of what those forms are, the dimensions of poverty and what our research is suggesting is some of those social psychological dimensions are ones that we should be measuring. And uh, We are currently, which is almost a way of answering your question, um, we are currently engaged with an NGO, ATD Fourth World, and hope, well, certainly with the French Department for International Affairs, and we hope with the World Bank, to start with people experiencing poverty in a range of countries, again, north and south, to ask what they see as being the dimensions of poverty. What we have at the moment is academics and practitioners, policy makers, defining those dimensions of poverty without consultation. So one starting point in relation to what governments North and South might think about is about the process of engaging people in poverty in thinking about the issues and indeed in thinking about the policy solutions to them. So in a sense it's a gender around true participation, true engagement. Speaking of global cooperation, as we speak right now, we have the climate, <laughs> sorry, climate action plan being drafted in Paris. You also have the Sustainable Development Goals Act, which is called adopted. How can we link the two with eradication of poverty? That's a big question, and I don't know the answer. Um, I don't know the answer. I know that I know that, that that in order to grapple with complex issues, historically we've tended to break them down. We've tended to invent government departments. We've intended to invent disciplines, um, um, and then you get half the answer in one department, half the answer in another, or half the answer in one discipline and half the answer in another. So they're in different places. So we have to be creative in terms of thinking about how, how we can bring them together. I haven't got a clear answer in, in, in relation to that. But I think, I think if, you know, in a, as an academic, I'm an academic, not a policy maker. Uh, I began as a civil servant, um, but I never sort of wanted to be a civil servant. Um, I don't have the political skills, but as an academic, it strikes me that discipline should be less important than problems and issues. 
And so if you think about an issue and then think about its ramifications and follow those ramifications, calling on appropriate disciplines, then you begin to see things in a much more holistic way. I don't know whether it's possible um, to capture those within a bureaucratic, in a bureaucratic institution. And I'm not, you know, I, and the, the extent to which climate issues impact on the experiences of people in poverty is, is going to be locally nuanced. Um, and the timing of that impact and the nature of that impact is going to be variable. Um, so I think it's about sensitising, I think it's about, I think it's about, okay, so we, we, we channel our thinking. I think, and that may be necessary, you need degrees of expertise. But I think constantly questioning oneself as a policy maker, just as a researcher, as soon as you, you believe you know the answer as a researcher, you cease to be a good researcher. Um, and I, I, I therefore think this process of self-reflection, which is at the heart of good research, if one could find a, a motive and mechanism to have that reflection in the policy-making process, maybe one could think about bringing those really big issues together. How India has to approach the entire goal of poverty eradication within the SDGs. Yeah. So, but uh, the trend that we're seeing with the new government coming in is that they're cutting on the social welfare expenditure, including health and education. And right now, our social expenditure on these basic sectors is even below 6%, and it's lower than most of the South Asian developing countries. So, how do you see this trend in uh, the recent measures the government will be taking? I'm not an expert on Indian public policy. In a sense, I wouldn't be cited as such. Um, and it's about priorities. Uh, who benefits from the cutting of health and educational expenditure? Um, certainly, surely, not people who are who have direct experience of poverty. So there's a there's a, a explicit or at least an implicit policy priority that you're not placing the eradication of poverty at the, at the heart of your policy agenda. Unless there is an argument which says that, um, and it's hard to tell, but hard to, hard to spell the story, um, that because we're spending too much on welfare, we're destroying financial incentives. Uh, that, that's slowing down the rate of the economy and uh, the signals are wrong and as a consequence the economy isn't growing and all those ideas about trickle down aren't working because we haven't got the extra wealth to facilitate that. But there's precious, if any, empirical evidence that that is true that I, I am aware of. Um, and the extent to which incentives and strengthened structures like that are what motivate people strikes me as being a very narrow view about the nature of human activity and the, and the factors which are important in people's lives. Um, so people, some maybe, some people choose to focus entirely their life on making money, which if you like, or maximizing utility is the way that economics thinks about the world. But when you talk to people, they would probably say that money is important but what does a mum put first? Uh, it puts forward, yes, money in order to feed my child, but to be a good parent is at the heart of the things that make, make them work as a human being. And I think those relationships are, are crucially important. So I think that model oversimplifies the way that individuals work. And there is, there is all the evidence that I have seen points in the direction of providing good public services allowing investment in human capital to achieve, a, to, be sh to be more broadly shared is something which makes an economy more effective and a society more cohesive. And you need cohesive societies in order to, to have decent economic growth and also to have a decent, create a decent working environment, I would have thought. So sir, uh, like, uh, so we're talking about economy and social welfare uh, policy, so just a little of the entire thing. Uh, how do you think the social welfare promises by the politicians work during their electoral agenda? Like, do they have an impact on the electoral politics as you think? Not just in India, or 
in other countries? Yeah, I'm not going to speak in terms of India. Um, I think you should go and talk to Sonny and Palas, Sonny Palas, really, in terms of thinking about the agenda around poverty and thinking about the role of the media in, in, in creating a, politi a political conversation, a political environment in which those sorts of, of, of decisions are, are made. I, reverting to an area where I feel more confident, which is talking about the UK, not necessarily a good model uh, for India, um, although we like to impose one when we were colonial powers, um, but don't don't borrow what happens in the UK at the moment. But I, th I think, I'm, I'm naturally optimistic. Uh, I think if one works at the interface between policy and academia, one has to be optimistic. Um, but where my optimism begins to fade is in terms of the changing nature of political dynamics in Britain and perhaps elsewhere, for which we as social scientists, I would argue, hold a degree of responsibility. What has, it, it's, it's easy to look back at perfect worlds, but one might suggest that the world that we used to have in British politics was a world where politics were framed by ideological positions. Um, and one's elections were about differences in ideology. And that when you elected a government, you, you knew what to expect. They often didn't deliver. The reality of government is different from the reality before government, but they aspired to do so. And when things went wrong, because you understood the ideology, you had some understanding of how the government would try to respond. Now, what has happened in, in the UK is that focus groups and polling has taught politicians how to win elections. And in a context which is a first past the post system, not proportional representation. The people who shape the outcome of an election are a comparatively small band of people who may vote left or may vote right. And so what, what, what political parties do is they engage in focus groups. And focus groups don't like ideology. They think in terms of the practical things of life. And so you don't get conversations about ideology that often. What focus groups say is what I would like as an individual. And what politicians therefore do is to think about what we can give to those individuals and present it in a language which is acceptable to them, which is a very commodified, very consumer orientated society, a, a, a commodity bargain between politician and voter, not one based on ideology. So you get two political parties who are largely competing on the same political agenda. And happenstance and personality gets one in rather than another. And then, because they're politicians who do have an ideological view, they try to implement ideological policies, which they haven't got the mandate to do because that ideology wasn't part of the discourse ahead of the election. Uh, so that mean, I, so that's, that is, is, is a plea for ideology to be brought back. Uh, and I don't know how we get there, because the power of being able to win an election through research evidence is, you know, would you, would you can, can you think a way of moving back from that? I can't. So at that level, I'm somewhat depressed. Uh, also, sir, uh, so right now we're seeing that most of the countries are on a track of fiscal austerity measures. And that means that there are serious cutbacks for all the social welfare policies. So how do you see this uh, connection? And how, do, how is it going to affect especially the poor people who do depend on social welfare policies? Well, this is where ideology has taken over. Because what is underpinning it is an ideological position, which goes back to this rather simple economic model, but also an ideology of of, of how you want society to work. Um, the case for austerity is heavily debated within the academic literature. I lean towards the left. My reading of that literature would say that the majority of the empirical evidence counters the notion that austerity is a sensible policy goal. Um, um, I, I therefore think it's inappropriate. Um, I think it adds to gr 
growing inequalities. I think growing inequalities are destructive in society. Um, I, I think social cohesion is vitally important. Um, a society is not a set of individuals who live together. Surely it must be a set of individuals who work together. And the notion of working together is, ev is embracing the interests of everybody. Okay, the prioritisation in that. But the notion of a simple model based on, on reducing the role of collective activity strikes me as being bizarre. Professor Walker, I have a leading question from your responses. It does seem that you know, you're referring to ideology having a critical role in, in politics and in a, a certain context. Yes, and in a certain level you're also talking about how uh, evidence on policy is not always factored in, into the process of uh, policy making. Now, uh, something that we hear in India as a criticism is that you know, the uh, academicians uh, work within their own ivory towers without having to reach out to what really is happening. Yeah. And the other criticism is that they are themselves uh, politicized to the extent of not really going for empirical reality as much as not, not, not trying to get the empirical reality as it were, yeah. objectively. Yeah. Uh, now, based on your exposure in the UK, what has your experience been in terms of academia and the world of policy? <laughs> I think the tensions you identify are real ones. In, in Britain, uh, British culture doesn't value academic scholarship. I think there's an interesting distinction if you catch the, uh, uh, the, um, uh, the train to take you from London to Paris, you change an environment in terms of the role that intellectual thought plays in politics. So British politics, British policy making is in many senses anti-intellectual. Um, part of that is because intellectuals don't like getting their hands dirty, they don't like making the compromises which are necessary in the policy world. So there, is, there really are two different worlds, but there are other people seeking to bridge those, those two worlds. And we, a decade ago, went through, uh, a, if you like, a policy experiment, which was to try to put evidence at the heart of policy. The, the Labour administration, in its first couple of first probably two, two governments, um, much to my surprise, actually lived up to this notion that we're going to pilot and try things out. And so you did have uh, a period of time when policies were attempted to be grounded in evidence. But of course, evidence is only one element in the policy-making process. And as an academic, we'd like to see it higher, but that's, that's undemocratic. There are different, different kinds of knowledge which are having to be brought to bear in the, in the policy-making process. Um, I, have, I began as a civil servant for a decade. Uh, I then worked in, for 20 years in research centres that were mixed funding, much of it, however, from government, the big money from government. So I've serviced governments across political persuasions with evidence. And as an academic, um, I have uh, become an academic, uh, which is different. So I. At the beginning of, of every academic year, I say to my students two things. I say, don't believe anything that I say, uh, because scholarship is about challenging. Um, and I don't have answers. Collectively, we can find answers. Um, and secondly, I say that from nine to five, I'm an academic. And from after five, I'm an activist. So as an academic, I can't eradicate my ideology but I try, through processes of reflection, to consider my ideology and how it's influencing the findings that I, that I say. So it, if you like, it's a, it's a double thought, but it's an intellectual way of attempting to cope, to cope with that. I think, I think you, in government, you use evidence traditionally in a different way. You, you seek evidence to support a policy, to support an idea. As an academic, you seek evidence in order to, to answer a question. So that's in slightly different, slightly different places. Um, I can give you examples of where my research has influenced policy. I can give you far many exa more examples of where it hasn't. Um, and much of that process is accidental. 
but it's also uh, uh, a, a real question about whether the academic is the best person to put evidence into the policy making process or whether they get tainted in that process. So take, I've been struggling for the last year. We, we've undertaken this whole series of projects around poverty and shame and they've been surprisingly influential. In one case purely by accident that we shared our research findings towards the end but before we got final conclusions with uh, a workshop of academics and policy makers and a civil servant from the ILO uh, was the International Labour Office was there and, and he said in my briefcase I have a draft recommendation and it was a draft recommendation uh, 202, which you may know is a, is a recommendation on social protection flaws, this idea that every country in the world should have a minimum social protection for all income and education and health. And he said, read it. And I read it. And what I recognised is that it made no mention of dignity, uh, no mention of respect. And I, so I phoned him up and said, it doesn't, he said, I know, that's why I gave it you. Well, what do I do? I said, he said, I can't tell you as a civil servant that I'm neutral in this process, but you might like to think about. And the sorts of things we think about was writing a, writing a briefing paper, which we then shared with the International Trade Union Council, which we shared with a, a grouping of uh, NGOs uh, that I spoke with, with the UN Special Rapporteur on, on, on human rights and extreme poverty, and, and she wrote a, a paper which went and to cut a long story short, there is now a line, a, a, a principle within that uh, recommendation which says that uh, governments should have respect for the rights and dignities, uh, a dignity of beneficiaries of social protection. So accidentally, you can have an impact. But, what I, but because of that impact in a way, I've been funded for perhaps the last year to disseminate my research and we've made, we've made a documentary, we've, we've engaged in soap operas, we've, we've put together a, an education pack around a piece of drama, we've engaged uh, with the Sustainable Development Goals. But there's a real problem, because if I'm selling my research, if I'm saying that it really is the case that we need to uh, de-shame policy, to shame-proof policy, I have to believe it. And as soon as I believe it, I cease to be a good academic and a good researcher. And so there's a real tension in terms of being the researcher and being the social mover. Right. Uh, so we can conclude with one, one last question. Yes. Pose the 2008 financial crisis. You see a lot of radical social movements in many parts of Europe. You had Syria coming to power in Greece. But yet again, would you say that they have been successful in fighting anti fighting austerity? and coming up with good welfare policies? I'm not sure that the two things, are, three things are connected. There's 2008, there's financial austerity, and there's four things maybe. There's the protests against that and coming up with social welfare policies. I think protest and designing policies are not necessarily on the same page of a book. So I don't think there's necessarily a connection. Um, have they, have they mobilised support against um, against austerity across Europe, highly debatable. I think. I think many many of us looked with uh, enthusiasm towards a democracy working in in, in Greece. Um, I think that the constraints of austerity thinking in Europe has stemmed the beneficial outcome of, of, of that democratic voice um, and I think there's real issues about how we build uh, international governance, um, uh, how we think collectively internationally, how we prioritise as we do it, as we try to do it in, in within nation states minority voices that nevertheless have credibility. Uh, how we build global governance I think must be your agenda for this this century i cannot see how we can we can address issues within nation states i think nationalism is a real problem and a real issue and you can see 
the dangers of that within Europe at the moment. You can also see the need for global governance in Europe at the moment when you think that much of the discussion about Greece, about austerity, about welfare reform as being overtaken by concerns about migration, about security. Um, these thinking globally about how we can address these issues, creating the structures. We have the UN, we have growing regional forms of governance. Finding ways of strengthening those uh, is necessary, um, which is a very long-winded way of not answering your question. <laughs> Uh, but um, your question and the movements, um, it's, it's, it's not clear to me that those movements have really become international movements and that's partly because we haven't got international governments with whom they can communicate.